Hi, my name is Jeff Petrakin. I'm an educator at the DNA Learning Center at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Today we're going to be working through one of my favorite laboratories, talking about how to detect genetically modified organisms in food items through a technique called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. So I have some uh, slides I'd like to share with you before we get started here on the actual wet, wet lab portion on it, just to talk a little bit about genetically modified organisms, what they are, and uh, why there's so much buzz about them, sort of a sensitive topic in, uh, in today's sort of world and popular culture. So let's jump into it. All right, so, sorry. There we go. So again, today's lab is actually a two-part lab. We're actually gonna be doing just the first half of the lab uh, today, and that's the DNA extraction of, uh, of DNA from a couple of different snack foods. And in particular, we're gonna be doing a little cheesy corn chip as well as a veggie stick. And uh, we're gonna set up the PCR. In the next section, part two, we're gonna actually take care of the gel analysis and actually determine whether or not the food items that we're working with actually have genetically modified organisms present. So before we get started, and so here's sort of a summary of, the, of that sort of outline. So again, today is just the DNA isolation as well as the amplification of that DNA by PCR. And next time we'll talk a little bit more about the actual results. And we'll take a look at the at a gel electrophoresis, which will allow us to see whether or not we have genetically modified organisms present in our food items. So of course we have to know a little bit about DNA before we get started here. And we always start with this, and it's, I kind of want to run through it a little bit because hope, hopefully a lot of you guys are sort of familiar with the structure of DNA and where it can be found. And just as a reminder, uh, DNA is made up of a double helix, and so it is a backbone of sugar and phosphate molecules um, united to another sort of strand of uh, nucleotides. And uh, in between those two sort of phosphate backbones, we have nitrogenous bases. And those nitrogenous bases are A, T, C, and G. So adenine, thymine, uh, guine, uh, cytosine, and guanine. And they bind to one another in a complementary fashion. So A always goes with T, and C always goes with G. Now, when we talk about DNA, very often we're concerned with the information that's contained within that DNA. And when we talk about organisms, in particular animals or plants, we're concerned with the sequence of nitrogenous bases or nucleotides that contain information for building proteins. And proteins, of course, are, the, are a major macromolecule in uh, all living things. And the sequence of amino acids that build, that make up a protein, uh, the information for building those proteins or that, that chain of amino acids is contained within the sequence of DNA nucleotides. And when we talk about a specific unit of, of nucleotides, um, the sequence of which confers building instructions for building a protein, we are talking about a gene. And that, that gene, that word gene, is very important in biology. Now, very often we teach this lab uh, with students at the Learning Center. Um, students often think that DNA equals genes. And, you know, that's not necessarily the case. So very often, a lot of the, of, a, of the genome, that's the entirety of the genetic complement of an organism, does not actually code for protein. A lot of it is regulatory sequence, or um, it contains building instructions for RNA, uh, and things of that sort of nature. So gene is a very particular thing. And for today, because we're talking about genetic modification in organisms, we are actually going to be talking about genes quite often. Because the, depending on what a genetic engineer is trying to accomplish in a particular organism, they might be interested in a, a gene that codes for one trait or another in that, or in that particular organism. And so we have to kind of understand the basic structure of the gene. So if you look up at our presentation here, you'll see that uh, in the middle here, this sort of yellow piece, we have an RNA coding sequence. And recall that DNA, the sequence of nucleotides, it, while it does build protein, it doesn't directly get interpreted from the DNA. So what happens first is a gene is transcribed. And that process of transcription creates a molecule of RNA. Or particular, in particular, messenger RNA, which carries the message or the sequence of DNA nucleotides out to the ribosomes, where that can then be translated into protein. And so we have our gene with the yellow piece in the middle here contains this sort of RNA coding sequence. And then at the front of the gene here, we have 
something called a promoter. Notice that that is colored green. Towards the end here, we have something colored red. We call that a terminator. And the colors are actually purposeful here because the promoter essentially tells something like RNA polymerase where to begin the process of transcription. The terminator tells RNA polymerase where to stop the process of transcription, just like a red, just like a green light and a red light. At least that's what I like to think of. And we're going to talk a lot about promoters today, so keep that in the back of your in the back of your mind. So, what is a genetically modified organism anyway? So, a genetically modified organism is one whose DNA or whose genetic structure has been purposefully manipulated in some way, shape, or form. So, it's not like like a chicken or a um, like a, a like a flower, like a rose or something like that, that's been selectively bred over many many generations to uh, emphasize certain desirable traits. That's a little bit different. Genetic mod genetic modification literally means you go straight to the DNA and you manipulate it, change the sequence of DNA in some way, in order to express a particular desired trait. Now. When we talk about taking DNA and sort of moving it around in organisms, we you sort of have to ask yourself, how do you even get that DNA to your desired organism in the first place? So for instance, if you wanted to say, insert a particular gene into a plant, you might want to use something called a gene gun. That's right up here. This is, a, this is an older model down here and here's a newer one over here. And they basically work the same way. It's literally, they literally just uh, like with high pressure blasts a little piece of DNA into plant cells and hopefully those cells will take up that um, that particularly uh, that engineered uh, gene of interest. For mammals, for instance, you might do something called DNA microinjection. And DNA microinjection essentially involves going to the, uh, uh, inserting DNA directly into the pronucleus of the developing zygote. So very early on in the, the uh, embryonic development of an animal, you may want to uh, incorporate a particular gene of interest. But there are other ways that you can modify organisms as well. So the process of transformation, for instance, that's the uh, essentially where you create a little sort of small piece of DNA that has a particular desired gene of interest. Um, and so up in the image here, we have a picture of a plasmid, a little tiny ring of DNA that can be taken up by a, something like a bacterial cell. And that bacterial cell will then begin expressing that particular gene of interest. Uh, plants, animals, and bacteria as well can also be modified by a viral transduction. So essentially using a virus, these little sort of nanoscale um, um, viral particles to take to sort of transfer DNA of interest into your particular host organism. So all of these are various different techniques, how you might want to move DNA into a particular organism of interest. But again, what genes are we really talking about here? So today's lab really focuses mostly on plants. And that's because a lot of work has been done using, um, uh, a lot of work has been done uh, in particular with plants trying to incorporate genes that might help farmers or uh, agricultural firms um, uh, breed, sort of uh, incorporate traits that are, are much more desirable into their particular crops. So if we go way, way back to the 50s and between the 50s and 70s, we have this period called the Green Revolution where uh, farmers started using sort of more high technology like these, this harvester up here um, or these sort of industrial sprayers. And they started using chemicals um, to control various different pests and uh, nutrient availability in the soil, et cetera, in their, in their crops. And so um, there's a lot of problems with that, however, because when you think about pesticides in particular, you know, nowadays, you know, the use of pesticides is, is looked at with some substantial negativity. Um, the same thing with herbicides, just because they can cause um, irreparable environmental harm, or they might cause uh, health, have health issues in, with relation to humans, or they might even just hurt organisms that you're not intending to hurt. And so farmers still, however, have to deal with a lot of these different issues, such as um, insect invasion or plant disease or the growth of weeds, which will siphon away nutrients from their crops. Um, and of course, there's always a growing population of uh, humans in the world where you have a rising sort of demand for food. And they need to be able to sort of rise to meet the occasion and meet that, you know, and produce enough supply to meet that demand. So, Nowadays, we're 
sort of in the midst of a second green revolution. And the second green revolution essentially involves more genetic manipulations and uh, looking for genes that might help farmers incorporate traits into their crops that are um, desirable while not having to use things like pesticides or uh, worrying about the weather, or the changing climate or something like that. So believe it or not, there are genes out there that code for proteins that will confer herbicide resistance, insect resistance, so basically like a, a insect toxin or something like that. Um, and you might, you might even find genes out there that will allow a particular crop to be able to survive a drought or a frost or, or something of that nature as well. So obviously these are important traits that um, agricultural industry might want to incorporate into various different crops. And the popularity of GM crops has grown substantially over the years. And uh, as of 2015, over 440 million acres of farming worldwide were planted with GM crops. That's pretty, pretty insane when you think about it. Here's a graphic from uh, USDA that sort of shows the percentage of GM crops, I believe just in the United States uh, in recent years. So from the 1990s all the way up to the um, recent years, 2017, I guess this goes up to. And as you can see, the percentage of GM crops has increased substantially over the years. Now, I wanted to, I'm actually an entomologist, so I study insects and spiders. So this is a sort of a topic that's very close to my heart. And I wanted to kind of give you an example of, of what a uh, gene or what a particular trait um, or genetically modified uh, uh, modification might be in a crop. And one of the most common examples is Bt. So Bt is uh, stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacterium um, that produces a toxin that affects Lepidopteran caterpillars. And when I say Lepidopteran, I mean butterflies and moths. So any sort of caterpillar. And it's pretty generalist. It'll attack anything from um, butterfly caterpillars all the way on down to little sort of pest caterpillars, like in the, in the image here, the European corn borer up here. And the toxin is a protein. And so genetic engineers were able to isolate the gene that, that uh, contains the building instructions for that toxin and incorporate it into various different crops, and in particular, corn. So what, what that winds up doing is that whenever this European corn borer larva winds up finding his way to a genetically modified uh, BT corn crop, he will start eating the leaves and inadvertently he will ingest some of that BT toxin, which will cause uh, serious digestive issues and will wind up actually causing him to die. And so what winds up happening relative to the farmer is the farmer doesn't actually have to spray pesticides or anything like that. Uh, he or she can sort of rest assured that the crop will be protected from at least Lepidopteran caterpillars um, without having to spend money and labor and, and uh, you know, cause further uh, damage to the environment with, by spraying pesticides uh, across his crops. So that's sort of the idea uh, with these GM crops. And like, as you saw from that, that graphic earlier, most, you know, especially in the United States, a lot of crops, a high percentage of them contain genetic modification. And so the idea of today's lab is we're going to try to see if there is evidence of genetic modification in a couple of different um, snack foods. And I'm going to be using a cheesy corn chip and a vegetable straw. I don't want to tell you the brand names. I don't want to annoy, you know, offend anyone or I mean, sort of legal, legal ramifications here, but I think it's pretty obvious what I'm going to be working with um, when you see them. But we are going to try to figure out if these uh, cheesy corn chips and these vegetable straws contain genetic modification, genetically modified uh, plant material. And how are we going to figure that out? Though? So if you think about being a genetic engineer, you, you know, it's not, it sounds like it's pretty easy. You just, you know, you, you find a gene of interest, you extract it from an organism, um, and then you, you, you sort of take that gene and you insert it into a new organism. It sounds pretty straightforward and simple, but remember what I said earlier, uh, especially in eukaryotic organisms, a lot of the genome of that organism, such as like a plant, for instance, um, is not just genetic information. There's a lot of regulatory sequence. And there's a lot of regulation going on in eukaryotic organisms. And so you have to sort of 
you know, put yourself in the shoes of the genetic engineer and, and think about it. Like, how do you know that when you actually incorporate that gene of interest, that particular, like that BT gene into your crop, how do you know that it's actually going to be expressed? So it turns out that a lot of times what a genetic engineer could do is incorporate a special promoter, a very, very highly efficient promoter, as a matter of fact. And that's what this 35S promoter is. It turns out that it's a very, very efficient uh, promoter. And it's originated in the cauliflower mosaic virus. It was extracted from turnips originally. And this promoter is extremely efficient. Uh, so essentially what I mean by that is that if I couple my gene of interest with a 35S promoter, I can almost be certain that my gene of interest is going to be expressed in my host organism. So it stands to reason then that if we could figure out a way to detect the presence of this 35S promoter, then we could theoretically say that, well, yeah, then I guess my, prop, my, my snack food does contain uh, genetically modified plant components. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And so, of course, this is science, right? So we need to sort of figure out a way uh, to make sure that what, the results that we're seeing actually are 35S or actually make sense. And so we want to use some sort of control as well. And a good control would be a ubiquitous protein or a ubiquitous gene, so something that should be found in pretty much all plants. And that would serve as a good control. That way, when we extract DNA from our, our snack foods, we can sort of amplify both of these elements, both tubulin and our, or our control, I should say, and our test group, this 35S promoter. So if we get DNA from our tubulin, if we actually successfully amplify tubulin, we know that we definitely extract the DNA from our, our snack food. Um, and then we sort of can compare what the amplification looks like for our 35S. So that's the idea. And this tubulin gene, just so you know, the tubulin protein rather, there's a, a, such a group of proteins and they're important in forming microtubules, just so you know. All right. So that being said, let's jump into the wet lab component of this lab. So I'm going to stop my screen share here, and I'm going to jump back over to my video here. Now, bear with me. I'm doing this in my dining room here, so it's a little bit cramped, and hopefully you guys can see everything that I'm doing, but I'm going to try to make this as visible and uh, visible as possible for you. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we are going to extract DNA from a cheesy uh, corn chip, as well as a bevy straw. And so I have those snack foods right here. There you go. So here's my cheesy corn chip. And here's my veggie straw. Now, it turns out that the veggie straw, you know, spoiler alert, <laughs> the veggie straw has been labeled as non-GMO. We're going to talk about labeling next time. I don't really want to get into that today. The extraction actually takes quite a bit of time. So I want to make sure that we get through that completely. So we'll talk about labeling tomorrow, but this is labeled as non-GMO. Cheesy corn chip over here does not have any labeling relative to GMO at all. In the United States, it's actually not uh, legally required for firms to uh, label their products as GMO or not, um, which is sort of interesting. So a lot of the times the labeling, uh, labeling comes into play. It's really like a marketing strategy a lot of the times, especially in the US. But anyway, these are my snack foods. Now, when it comes to DNA extraction from any organism, it can be a difficult procedure. Now, when we're talking about processed foods like this corn chip or the veggie straw, um, you know, it's kind of hard to extract DNA out of these things. So with this lab in particular, this is one of the most challenging protocols of any of the, the labs that we do with our students at the DNA Learning Center. Very often, it's hard to imagine, it's hard to sort of predict what we're going to get. Um, I chose these two because I've done this lab many, many times. And usually, these two work. So hopefully, tomorrow, we'll see some good results from these. But you got to imagine that this is not like this, this is straight up made from fresh corn. There's a lot of processing and other additives that go on. So any DNA that is in here uh, may be damaged or just processed beyond the point of recognition. Okay, so to start our DNA extraction, the first step that we have to do here is grab a couple of tubes and take a small piece of our snack foods. And so I've already actually gone through this the protocol and extracted DNA from both of these just in the, for the uh, 
for the benefit of time. But I'm going to go through this extraction with you for just the two snack foods. We also, when we're doing this, want to extract DNA from controls. Now, both of these are sort of experimental groups, right? So again, we want to, when we're talking about science, and especially molecular biology, it's good to have a lot of controls. And it turns out that I do have some other controls. Um, I did with them. Hang on one second. All right. Sorry, guys. I don't know where they are, but it turns out that I have some uh, corn leaves that are from both genetically modified corn, for sure, and a corn leaf from non-genetically modified corn. And so the reason that I'm doing those as well is just to be sure, to be certain that I, uh, that the sort of let the procedure actually work. So just to test basically whether or not I'm if I don't get any DNA from these, it has something to do with the experimental design or the reagents that I'm using, and not just because I just didn't get DNA from these, if that makes any sense. So we are going to just focus on these two for now. And so when you talk, okay, there, here we go. Here's my, here's my controls. So I've already extracted DNA from these guys. So I'm going to put them off to the side. Um, but anyway, we're, we talk about extracting DNA. One of the first things that we need to do is get a sufficient uh, size of each of our snack foods. Now, I always tell the students, it's kind of hard to imagine this. It's hard to you know, sort of believe this, but you only need about one, a little sort of chunk from here that's like one to two millimeters in size, a very, very small amount. If you take too much of this snack food and you try to extract DNA from it, now, you know, logically it's like, well, the more piece of snack food that I have, the more DNA that I have, that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of other things in here in that. And so if you take a, a large chunk of, of this chip, for instance, there might be so much fat in here that it sort of dilutes the DNA to the point where we're not going to be able to get a good amplification out of this. So getting the right size is key. You know, by the same principle, if you get a piece that's too small, there might not be enough DNA in there for you to see. So I'm going to just basically use my fingernails here. Hopefully you guys can see this. And break off a little tiny piece. Just like that. And I'm going to put it in a tube here and put it at the bottom of the tube. And I'll hold it up to the camera so that you guys can see that. So that's all we need. That's actually a little more than I'm, I usually do, but that's, that should be good. So I'm going to do that with both of my snack foods. And so these tubes that I'm using here, by the way, are These tubes that I'm using here are called microfuge tubes. Now, microfuge tubes are a common, it's a little too big. There we go. There's my veggie stick. Now, these microfuge tubes are a common tool in molecular biology labs. They're called microfuge tubes because, uh, and actually short for microcentrifuge tubes. They are designed to fit in this little guy over here. This is a microcentrifuge. And so we're going to use this in a little bit. In fact, we're going to use it a lot today. Um, but for now, just know that that's what these are called, microfuge tubes. All right. So once we have our snack food sort of samples um, picked off, I already went ahead and labeled these tubes. The yellow tube here is for the cheesy corn chip. And the green tube here is going to be for the veggie straw. Now, I'm going to basically try to keep those colors consistent throughout the rest of the day here. Um, so just know that I'm always going to be labeling them, you know, in that way. Um, all right. So the first step that we need to do is we need to grind up this sample. And we don't want to just grind it uh, dry. We actually want to put it in a solution. And in particular, we're going to put it in what's called a lysis solution or a lysis buffer. So I have some lysis buffer right here. And I'm going to put 300 microliters of lysis buffer into each one of these tubes. Now, a microliter, for those of you guys that don't know, is a very, very small amount of liquid. A microliter is actually a millionth the size of a liter. Very, very small. So basically, like if a snowflake were to land on your fingertip and melt, that would be about one to two microliters of liquid. So we're not talking about a lot of liquid. So therefore, we need a tool to help us measure accurately. And right here at the front of the table here, I have a whole bunch of pipettes. I have three pipettes, actually, not a whole bunch. <laughs> but notice that I've got three different colors. I've got a blue, a yellow, and I've got a gray. 
And now each of these is designed to hold a different sort of volume range of liquids. So the blue here holds the most. It holds anywhere between 100 and 1,000 microliters. The yellow holds anywhere between 10 and 100 microliters. And the gray is the most precise. It holds anywhere between a half a microliter to 10 microliters. And they all basically work the same way. Essentially, inside of the pipette here, there is a big empty space. And there's a little button up on top of this pipette. I can push down on that button, and it pushes out the exact volume of air that the pipette is set for. There's actually two stop points here, too. So if I push down, it stops right at the bottom of this button. It's kind of hard for you guys to see. But we call that the first stop. So when I push to the first stop, I'm pushing out the exact volume that the pipette is set for. If I push a little bit harder, I can push all the way down. When I push that all the way down, that is called the second stop. And that pushes out a little bit more volume than the pipette is set for. So when I push to the first stop, that's typically going to be for measuring, because I want to be precise when I'm measuring. So therefore, if I'm pushing out the exact volume it's set for, I know that that's the exact volume that I'm going to be measuring. The second stop, on the other hand, is for pushing out. The reason that that pushes out more air is just because of the fact that a lot of the solutions in a chemistry lab or a molecular biology lab are dissolved in water. Um, that's the solvent. And water, as you guys may know, have, uh, has some very special properties. So they have adhesive as well as cohesive properties. So they like to stick to the walls of the container that they find themselves in, water molecules that is, and they like to stick to each other, respectively adhesion cohesion. So the second stop, basically, you just blast out a little bit more air just to push everything out of the, the pipette. <coughs> so I'm going to go ahead and set my blue pipette. Remember, I need to measure 300 microliters of lysis buffer. I'm going to set my blue pipette for 300 microliters. And on the blue pipette, there's a little black box with four numbers on the side. And it says 0300. You guys definitely can't see that, so I don't want to show <laughs> so 0300, zero, zero, that's 300 microliters. Um, now, obviously I can't just use the pipette like this because if I put liquid in the pipette uh, right now, it's going to basically contaminate the pipette for future uh, measurements of different solutions. So we have these little helpful tools here called pipette tips. And these pipette tips are disposable and there is a color of pipette tip for each one of the different pipettes. So I'm going to be using the blue pipettes right, blue, blue pipette tips right now for the blue pipette, and um, I'm going to basically get to get the tip on. You just basically sort of push it in very gently, and the tip just sort of stays right on. Now these are disposable, and they'll allow me to sort of change the tips in and out when I'm working between different samples to prevent contamination. So I'm going to go over to my lysis solution, my lysis buffer, and I'm going to get 300 microliters. Now when I do that to measure. I'm going to push to my first stop. That pushes out 300 microliters of air. Then when I take that pipette tip, I'm going to go right underneath the liquid, and I'm going to let go very slowly with my thumb, and I'm going to be taking up 300 microliters of liquid. So right there, you can see in the tip of the pipette, we've got 300 microliters of liquid. Then when I'm ready to get that liquid out, I go to my tube with the cheesy corn chip in it, I'm going to go down to the bottom of the tube, and I'm going to go to my second stop to blast all of that liquid out. Okay, notice that I'm keeping my thumb on the button the whole time. If I let go when I'm in there, I'm just going to suck the liquid back up, so I don't want to do that. But now that I've done that, just in case I touch the chip, I'm going to dispose of this tip, and I have a little beaker here that's going to serve as my waste. To get the tip off, I basically just push this little gray button here, and that'll eject the tip off for me. I'm going to go ahead and repeat the process with the veggie straw. Now, I mentioned this lysis, lysis buffer, and you guys should be hinted or cued into what that actually is for, what it does, just by the name. So when we hear that word lysis, it essentially means to break up. And so the lysis buffer is a specific combination of chemicals that's essentially going to help to break down some of this material in here, and it's going to sort of liberate the DNA out into solution. I'm going to help it along with a little bit of mechanical lysis as well. So each one of these samples, I'm going to grind up with a little pestle. So here is a pestle right here, just this little plastic thing. Uh, I'm going to use one pestle per sample just because I don't want to contaminate and mix the DNA from here with the DNA from the other two. And I'm going to grind this 
for about two to five minutes. I'm not going to go crazy with it now um, just because of time. But I'm going to grind this for about two to five minutes. And usually with these snack foods, um, the grinding that you need to do is pretty minimal. Uh, they'll grind up pretty quickly. But the goal is to have nothing left over. And all you want is a nice cloudy solution of, uh, of lysis and ground up snack food. So uh, I don't know if you guys can see that, but essentially right now, I took me less than a minute and I ground up the veggie straw. And it is basically uh, pulverized completely. I'm gonna do the same thing for the Dorito. <laughs> Cheesy corn chip. <laughs> and okay. All right, so there we go. And that's basically ground up as well. Now, the lysis buffer is great at sort of breaking things up, but we might want to help it along a little bit. So what I'm going to do is put our, our, uh, our pulverized samples here. I'm going to put them in a heat bath set for 65 degrees Celsius. So right up here at the front of the room, I have a simple water bath here. There's a little lid on here and, and essentially water inside and a little foam sort of holder. And the water is heated to, uh, well, actually, this is set for 57 degrees Celsius right now. And so what I would do is take these, and I'm going to let them sit in there for at least about 10 minutes or so. Now, I've gone ahead and done this already for us, just so that we don't have to sit here and wait for that. So I've got my, my uh, cheesy uh, corn chip, as well as my veggie straw tubes already um, having, the, having sat in the incubator at 65 for about 10 minutes. So I'm going to move on from that step. Uh, just because of the time. I don't really want to waste time sitting here waiting for it. So imagine that 10 minutes has gone by in that incubation. And again, that temperature is to help the lysis solution uh, break up um, as much of that, that sort of solid snack food material as possible and liberate as much DNA as possible. The next thing that I'm going to do is spin these down for about a minute. We don't want all of that solid material left over. So with the snack foods, you'll notice that um, there's a lot of fat and a lot of other stuff in here that's not necessarily solid, but we, try, we don't really want any of that. We just want straight up a, a liquid solution, a, a nice liquid solution, because that's where the DNA is. The DNA has been liberated and is floating around dissolved in solution. So in order to separate all of that um, solid material away, we're going to use this mini centrifuge over here. Now, the centrifuge, so first of all, we're going to be using this a lot today. And when it comes to using a centrifuge, there are a couple of safety issues. So first of all, imagine that here's my centrifuge all closed up and ready to go. I just basically hit the, oh, oh, no, no. I just basically hit the open button. And that's going to go ahead and open this lid here. Inside, there's this little pot lid. I'm going to take the pot lid off and we have this little rotor. And there are little holes that are uh, perfectly, uh, perfect size to fit these microfuge tubes. So I'm going to put these tubes in, but I'm going to put them in a very specific way. So first of all, when we spin in a centrifuge, regardless of the size of the centrifuge, whether we're doing it in bio, chemistry, physics, whatever, you always have to balance the centrifuge. So understand that this little machine is going to spin around at about 13,500 RPM, very fast. And there's a little tiny rotor on the inside that's spinning around. If you have an unbalanced, uh, if you have an unbalanced, unbalanced tubes in the centrifuge, the rotor is going to wobble around like this, and it might crack and explode, which is obviously not good. So what we mean by balancing the centrifuge is that if I have a tube with this much liquid in it on one side, I have to have a tube with this much liquid on the other. When I spin, I'm also going to spin with the hinges on the tubes facing out. So you guys will notice that when I take these tubes out, so I'm going to set the time for a minute. I'm going to press start. When I take those tubes out, you'll notice that a lot of the liquid has sort of gathered, a lot of the solid rather, has gathered to the bottom of the tube, and then there's liquid up on top. The stuff on the bottom of the tube is called the pellet. The stuff on the top, the liquid, is called the supernatant. And at different points throughout the lab today, we're going to be saving the supernatant and throwing away the pellet and vice versa. But you always have to pay attention to where the DNA is going to be in today's lab as well as when you want to save the pellet or throw away the pellet. Okay, so 
In the meantime, I'm going to get two fresh tubes labeled here. So I'm going to label my duty, my veggie straw, and I'm going to label my cheesy corn chip. And what I'm doing is preparing some tubes so that I can measure out some fresh supernatives. I'm actually going to measure out 150 microliters of supernatives, as a matter of fact. So I'm using that blue pipette again. All right, so I'll take these tubes out. And the very first thing that you should notice is that, oh wow, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fat in this tube. So I don't know how well you guys can see, but there's only a very small amount of liquid up on top. There's a lot of heavy fat on the bottom, however. So I'm gonna try to only get that liquid and nothing else. So I'm going to tilt the pipette like this. If you spun with the hinges facing out, you're basically only going to get the liquid. I'm sorry, if you spun with the hinges facing out, um, all of your, your solid, all of that um, pellet is going to be sort of piled up right beneath the, the hinge on the tube, which is exactly why I tell you to spin with the hinges facing out. So there we have about 150 microliters of uh, liquid from the supernatant. Now it's probably less than that, but that's okay. It's better to have a pure uh, supernatant here than it is to have a, uh, some solid chunks and all that fat stuff, we don't want that in there. So this now becomes garbage. I'm gonna throw that away. I'm gonna repeat the process for the other, for the veggie straw. Okay, so again, I go in there and I'm going to simply take up 150 microliters from just the supernatants. And that one was a lot easier. Okay, I'm gonna put that in my fresh tube here. All right. So we have our supernatants here. Now the next step. We've gotten rid of a lot of that solid material. Now we need to add something that will attract the DNA and pull that away from the solution or allow us to pull that away from the solution. So for this step, we're gonna be using silica. So if you've been following along on the DNA LC Lives page, you may have seen uh, someone using silica already. And basically silica is just a microscopic resin. It's a little tiny bead. And that bead will reversibly bind to DNA. So again, the silica resin will reversibly bind to DNA. Now it's a milky sort of solution here, and I don't need a lot of it to accomplish the goal that I, I set out for. So I'm basically only going to be using three microliters. That means I'm using my gray pipette here. And I'm going to put three microliters of this silica resin. Okay, that's, that's my resin right there. I'm going to put three microliters of that silica resin into each one. of my tubes of supernate. I'm changing the tips, of course, because we don't want to mix the two. And notice that I'm also pipetting the silica directly into the liquid that's there already. So when you're pipetting from this point on in the lab, it's a good idea to inject the liquid that you're trying to pipet into the liquid that's already there. Okay. So now I have to mix this up a little bit. So the silica, which I don't know, you guess you probably can't see this, but the silica has sort of settled itself out on the bottom of the tubes. Uh, what I could do is do something called pipette to mix, or I could just basically break up, which is what I'm going to do in the interest of time. Okay. There we go. So there, my silica is all sort of bound up and has sort of dissolved in the solution. Your goal is to get a nice cloudy solution. These tubes are gonna now sit for about five minutes in the incubator. It could be less, it's probably gonna be less actually. And in the meantime, let's talk about the next step. So remember, what's happening right now is we are putting the, we put these tubes mixed with our supernatant, which contains the DNA or which contained the DNA. Uh, we've added silica resin. That silica resin is attracting DNA that's dissolved in that solution. And we're putting the tubes in the incubator here for about uh, five minutes at 57 degrees to sort of encourage that reversible binding 
to the silica residue. So this is sort of ensuring that we're getting a little bit more uh, DNA to bind to uh, the our silica. Now, after about five minutes, we have to purify our DNA out of the solution. So what do you think that means we have to do? We're gonna have to use our centrifuge again. So remember, the silica is pretty heavy. It's a milky sort of solid solution. That's gonna be a lot heavier than the supernatant, the liquid that we put it into. So if we use the centrifuge to help us, we can get rid of the rest of the liquid that's not DNA and that's some other impurities. And at the same time, we could use something to help clean up our DNA, get rid of even more impurities that might just be associating with the silica. So for that, we're going to use something called a wash buffer. So this wash buffer is another mixture of different chemicals. Uh, in particular, it contains ethanol, and that'll help to clean up our, our, our DNA from the silica. Actually, I'm sorry, it'll help to clean up our, our uh, DNA and it'll help to remove other impurities that, so the DNA is still bound to the silica. I just want to make that clear. Okay, so let's assume five minutes has gone by here. And I'm going to go ahead, pull out these two tubes, and I'm going to put them back into the centrifuge. This time we don't need to spin for quite so long. We're going to only spin for about maybe 30 seconds. So I'm going to close it up, make sure it's balanced. I put the lid back on, and I'm going to push the down arrow until I get to 30 seconds. And I'm going to push start. In the meantime, <clears throat> I'm going to get my blue pipette ready because we need to now remove the liquid that is that does not contain DNA. So remember, the DNA is going to be in the silica. It's going to be in the pellet all the way at the bottom of the tube. So I want to get rid of everything that's not the pellet. So all of that supernatant. So this time the supernatant is going in the garbage. I get my blue pipette at the ready. Okay, I'm gonna take my two tubes out of here. Now the pellet is basically pretty solid and pretty clear at this point. It's a little white sort of frisbee all the way at the bottom of the tube. The supernatant is also pretty clear. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take out every bit of liquid that is not pellet. So when I use the pipette in this way, I wanna be extra sure that I'm not actually touching that pellet. I don't wanna break it up. Again. And because this is waste, I'm gonna just throw the whole thing into the garbage. So I'm gonna go ahead and repeat the process for the next tube. Okay, so there's that pellet again, all the way at the bottom. And I'm gonna take out all of that liquid. Okay, this is a little viscous. I'm going to try to get a little bit more of that liquid out. And uh, if you, you don't have to be this precise at this point, because again, we're going to be using the wash buffer, but uh, might as well. There's still quite a bit of liquid in there. I used just the yellow pipette to get a little bit more uh, of the liquid out. Okay, we're ready for the wash buffer. So now the wash buffer, we're going to be adding 500 microliters, and it works best when it is ice cold. So I have it sitting here in, uh, in ice at the moment. And I'm going to be adding 500 microliters of that wash buffer. So again, I'm using the blue pipette. So my blue pipette. And the, the wash buffer here is sitting on ice again. It is nice and cold. And the reason why the wash buffer should be cold is just because it's thermodynamically apparently it's better at removing sort of shocking some of those impurities and getting them off of the silica uh, while still maintaining the, the DNA having DNA bound to the silica. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, dispense all of that wash buffer into my pellet. Now, the next thing is I'm going to break up the pellet completely. And to do that, I'm going to do what's called pipettes and mix. So that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So I basically go to my first stop, I go into the liquid, and I basically go to my first stop and release a whole bunch of times. And I basically continue until my pellet is completely dissolved and it's a nice cloudy solution. I'm going to repeat the process for my other sample. So I get my 500 microliters of ice cold wash buffer. I go over to my veggie straw tube. I pipette to mix, I break up that pellet. Okay, good to go. Pretty cool, right? Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, spin this down again. So remember the whole purpose of this was to clean any impurities off of the pellet, off of the silica. 
So I'm going to repeat that whole process one more time. I'm actually going to do a second wash, as a matter of fact. So the end product of this procedure here is going to be a couple of tubes of purified DNA. So the whole point of doing this wash multiple times is to get a pure sample of DNA as possible. Once you get a sample of purified DNA, you can then use that DNA for multiple different other experiments. So today we're going to be setting up a PCR for our two tests. Uh, our, our gene and gene regions, the 35S and the tubulin. But you could basically now use this, use another gene if you wanted. You could try to amplify another gene using the DNA that you extract during this process. So this DNA extraction is not necessarily unique to just this particular lab. But anyway, so again, we have our pellet at the bottom. The, the uh, pellet is pretty clear this time. I'm going to use the blue pipette and remove all of that supernatant. So that's basically just mostly wash buffer. I'm going to get as much of that liquid out as possible. I'm going to repeat the process. The other tube. Then I'm going to add another 500 microliters of wash buffer. And I'm going to pipette to mix again and break up that pellet. So again, we have a nice cloudy solution. I'm going to spin it one more time to get rid of that wash buffer that I just added. Okay, so I pipette to mix one more time. It's a little too vigorous with my pipetting to mix here, and I got some out on my finger, which is not good. That means I'm losing possible DNA. Gonna spin that eight, spin that down again. Now, this second wash, honestly, probably you could skip if you if you were pressed for time. But I like to do it anyway, just to get as pure a sample as possible. So when our tubes come out of this spin, the DNA, remember, is still gonna be attached to the pellet. We need to now try to get the DNA off of the pellet. And the way that we're gonna do that is by eluding the DNA off of the silica. And a good Elutins would be distilled water, since DNA is soluble in water. So I have up here a tube of distilled water. So this distilled water, again, will remove the DNA from that silica resin. But first, I have to get rid of every last drop of wash buffer this time. So I'm going to be extra precise about removing every little bit of liquid. So I'm going to use my blue pipette first. Get really close to the pellet, but not touch it. And then I'm going to use my yellow pipette. And I'm going to set my yellow pipette for maybe like 50 to 75 or so, just to get rid of the rest of the liquid that's in that tube. Again, this time, hopefully, whatever is in the silica is just DNA. We don't want any, any of those other impurities. So I go right down to the bottom, and I get out the rest of the liquid. So at this stage, we should just have a dry pellet, preferably no liquid at all. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat with my other tube. Okay. All right, there we go. Some dry pellets. Now I need my distilled water. And I'm only going to, I only need about 100 microliters of distilled water for this. So I'm actually going to use my yellow pipette again, set for 100 microliters. Now you couldn't use the blue pipette, however, but Remember, the yellow pipette's a little more precise because it's smaller. It's intentional that it will be, it's better. It's, you're going to be more accurate if you measure uh, 100 microliters with the yellow pipette. So I would use the yellow pipette for this step. I'm going to go ahead and get my distilled water. And I'm going to pipette to mix in each of these tubes. And I'm going to do this until the pellet completely breaks up. Again, we're trying to elute DNA off of the silica. We're trying to get the, the water to spread around as much of the silica as possible to remove as much DNA as possible. So when you pipette to mix at this stage, it turns out to be a nice white sort of liquidy milky solution. That's what your goal is. It almost looks like non-fat milk. Um, I'm going to put this back into the incubator for about five minutes here. 
at 57 degrees Celsius, just to sort of encourage some of the, um, the DNA to, bond, to uh, blah, 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 move away from the silica. And I'm gonna repeat the process for my other tube here. Remember, we wanna break up every little ounce of pellet that we can see. Okay, there we go. And we'll put that in the heat depth in a few minutes. So now, theoretically, what's happening in there is the DNA is moving away from the silica. So now we just want the DNA. So what do we have to do again? All right, spin, centrifuge, one more time. This time, however, we want to get rid of the pellet. We don't want the pellet. Okay, as a matter of fact, when we set up the PCR later on, if we get silica into the DNA tube, the silica, it can actually inhibit PCR. We don't want any silica at all. So when we pipette this time, we have to be extra careful. So before I do anything else, I'm going to go ahead and get two tubes ready. These tubes are going to be for our purified DNA. So I'm going to get a green tube and I'm going to get a yellow tube. One for the cheesy uh, corn chip and one for the veggie straw. Okay, so these are going to serve as our, our DNA cache tubes. Now, I'm going to only take 50 microliters of supernatant. Again, I don't want to go anywhere near that pellet when I, pipe, when I pipette for the next step. So I'm going to preset my pipette here for 0500. And after I spin, when it comes out of the heat bath here, we're only going to get 50 microliters. And once we're done with this, we will have essentially extracted DNA. So what comes next? We can take that DNA and we can set up various different types of experiments, various different PCR reactions. And so the machine that helps us carry out this PCR, these reactions, is this fellow right here. This is called a thermal cycler. And specifically, this is a MJ Mini thermal cycler. Now, this is nothing more than a glorified hot plate. It's really all it is. It just heats up and cools down in programmable ways. And so the process of PCR, which I don't want to dwell on here today, just because a lot of our labs on DNA LCY talk about PCR. You guys can uh, look up the details of it. Um, but PCR essentially relies on three steps. The denaturation of DNA by heating, the annealing of what are called primers. Those are the specific targeters that will help your PCR actually identify which particular gene or gene region to amplify. And then a, uh, a final extension step, which uh, involves the copying and the amplification of, of um, uh, from the primers, more or less. And uh, those involve various different fluctuations in temperature. So this guy right here will take care of that for us. So what our goal is now is to get DNA from there and set up our reactions. And after the PCR runs, which I think this program takes about an hour and a half or so, tomorrow or the next uh, session here, part two of, of our, our lab here, we'll be able to see whether or not we actually amplify genetically modified components from our, our snack foods. Okay, so let's get that those tubes out. It's been roughly around five minutes. And I'm going to go ahead and spin this for just 30 seconds. Got my tubes labeled already. We're all good to go there. So we just have to get our DNA. Now, I already have, as I mentioned earlier, DNA that I've amplified from both of my snack foods as well as my controls. So I've taken the liberty of labeling my PCR reactions and setting them up already. But we just have to add the DNA to those tubes. I'll show you what those look like in a second. Let me get this over with here. So once you actually get this purified DNA, by the way, um, you can actually store this in a freezer, ideally at negative 20 or so, and uh, that will stay for quite a long time. So you can continue continue to work with various different with these with the DNA that you amplify here uh, for the future. So again, when I measure my 50 microliters of supernatant, I'm going to sort of keep away from that pellet on the bottom there. Don't want to dislodge that pellet at all. Then this becomes waste. I can throw that away, and boom, there we go. So here is the DNA from my veggie straw, nice purified clean DNA. Going to change my tip. And let's go ahead and do the same for the cheesy uh, corn chip. 
Okay. Again, that's garbage. And there's our DNA from our corn chip. There's a big bubble in there. That's okay, though. No, no big deal. All right. So let's set up our PCR real quick. So it turns out that DNA out over here. We don't need a lot of DNA to set up our PCR. We only need about two microliters or so. So I'm only going to use my gray pipette here, set for 0, 2, 0, 0. That's it. We don't need a lot. This is a very common point at which students make mistakes just because they can't actually see two microliters in the tip of the pipette, especially because the DNA, as you may have noticed, is clear. Um, so always be careful and double check that you actually have liquid at this point in your, in your experiment. Now, I've taken the liberty of setting up the PCR reactions already. So I have a tube or a, a um, strip of tubes here with a pink solution. This strip of tubes uh, and the pink sol solution inside is all you need to carry out PCR. So that pink solution actually contains things like buffer to maintain pH, um, nucleotides to a sort of like source material to amplify and grow many more chains of DNA. Um, it contains DNA polymerase and specifically TAC polymerase from the bacterium Thermophilus aquaticus, uh, which can sustain the temperatures at, uh, that the PCR occurs. That's the construction crew, by the way, for building copies of DNA. And it also contains the primers. So the primers are the uh, specific little stretches of DNA that will target the gene region of interest. So we're going to talk more about the primers tomorrow. We're actually going to use them over the next part two of this session. We're going to talk more about them tomorrow. So don't harp on those right now. But just know that the tubulin primers occur in this tube here and the 35S primers occur in this tube here. So we're actually setting up two different PCR reactions using the same source DNA. Remember, we're trying to check the 35S to see if it's been genetically modified and our tubulin is a control, just to see if we've actually extracted DNA in the first place. So I'm basically just gonna add two microliters of DNA to each one of these tubes. Now, we have to change our tips every single time we add to these tubes, just so you know. So I'm gonna go ahead to my source material for the veggie straw here, okay, and I'm going to add that directly in to the pink solution in the tube. I'm going to change my tip. I'm going to repeat the process, get another two microliters, and add that into the tubulin reaction as well. Okay, so we know that that one is done. I'm going to go ahead and repeat for the cheesy corn chip. guys are done as well. I'm going to go ahead and load the others as well while I'm here. Bear with me, guys. So this is the DNA from that positive GMO corn. That's going to be a control as well, remember. And remember, we're doing that just so that we can be sure that the primers that I'm using actually work and that this reaction is successful. So theoretically, we should show 35S um, amplification from our positive control here. Our negative control, that's from the negative corn plant. That's, remember, I told you I, I did both of these ahead of time. I didn't want to waste time doing it here. Um, our negative control uh, should not show any 35S modification. I got a question for you guys. Why am I changing the tips? I'm, because I'm using the same DNA for both tubes. Why can't I just use the same tip both times? Or could I? No, as a matter of fact, I can't because each of these tubes contain different primers. I don't want to mix the primers together. If I do, I might throw off the reaction. I might get weird amplification that I'm not expecting. So I'm definitely going to be want to switch my tips every single time here. Okay, last one, last one. All right, so there we go. Got all of our reactions set up. So again, I the only thing that I just added here is essentially the template DNA. So all of these tubes, yes, they contained everything that we needed to carry out PCR except for template DNA. That's what we just added. So now I go over to my PCR machine here, my thermal cycling, and I can put them into these little tiny holes in the PCR machine. These holes are designed to fit 
uh, these little tubes. These little baby tubes, by the way, are called PCR tubes for that reason. Just want to make sure all the liquid is down on the bottom there. All right. And every different set of primers. Oh, sorry, guys. Every different set of primers uh, requires a different. PCR protocol, just so you guys know. Okay, here we are. Uh, so the GMO primer has all the GMO program has already been pre-programmed into this machine here. So I'm just going to go ahead and select that. So run, I'm going to find GMO, and I hit enter, and I hit run. Verify the volume, and we are good to go. And there you have it. So the PCR is up and running. This is going to take about an hour and a half or so. And what's happening again is that uh, in each of those separate sets of tubes, our control DNA, as well as our DNA from our cheesy corn chip, as well as our veggie straw is being amplified. Okay, going through PCR. It's actually 30 cycles. So in, a, in an hour and a half or so, we should have over a million, over a billion copies of both tubulin and 35S mean. That's the whole point of this PCR, by the way. It's to amplify. So there's not a lot of DNA present in these tubes by themselves. So we're trying to make more, many more copies of the region that we're interested in and uh, so that we can move forward in our experiment. And so tomorrow, if you guys direct your attention to our PowerPoint here, go ahead and get to where I need to be. Hang on one sec, guys. So tomorrow, we are going to be focusing on our, okay, sorry. We're going to be focusing on bioinformatics. <laughs> sorry, the phone's ringing, guys. Uh, we are going to be focusing on a bioinformatics exercise, and we are going to try to predict the size of our 35S region, as well as tubulin. And then we're going to take a look at our results through a technique known as gel electrophoresis. And that's the plan. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And I hopefully will see you for part two uh, tomorrow. Thank you so much.